So I think every day, every second you may be experiencing hiccups because millions of students globally are referring this book at every moment. So this is what the experience, everyone learns from it. So coming to Sir's biodata, Sir has a very huge biodata. I will just highlight few of them. Professor Scott Gilbert is a Howard Letterman Professor Emeritus at Swarthmore College and a Finland Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Helsinki Institute of Biotechnology. He teaches developmental biology, developmental genetics, and the history of biology. After receiving his BA from Wesleyan University, he pursued his graduate and postdoctoral research at the John Hopkins University and the University of Wisconsin. Professor Gilbert is a recipient of several very prestigious awards, including the first Victor Emberger Award for the Excellence in Developmental Biology Education, the Alexander Kowalski Prize for Evolutionary Developmental Biology, and the Medal of Francois from the College de France. Professor Gilbert had been awarded with honorary degrees from the University of Helsinki and University of Tartu. Professor Gilbert is a fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science a corresponding member of the St. Peterburg Hello? Hello, sir. Hello? Okay. Yes, sir. I, I lost you for a moment. Oh, okay. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. Professor so Gilbert me... is a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science a corresponding member of the St. Petersburg Society of Naturalists and on the International Advisory Board of the National Institute of Basic Biology in Japan. He has been chair of the Professional Development and Education Committee of the Society for Developmental Biology. His research pursues the developmental genetic mechanisms by which the turtle forms its shell and the mechanisms by which plasticity and symbionts contribute to development. With this brief introduction, I welcome sir to deliver his invited talk in this lecture series. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is an honor to be here, truly. And I really am pleased to be part of your symposium on the new zoology of the 21st century. I think that that is a fundamentally important topic because I think the biology of the 21st century differs enormously from the biology that I was taught in the 20th century. And so I'm going to share my screen, I hope. Oh, let's see. Yes, sir, you can share. Okay. And let's see if I can get... Get this over here. Here we go. And whoops, nope. Okay, great. I want to talk about the zoology of the 21st century. And I want to talk about holobionts and their pathways of development. And this is not the usual talk I give because I really want to look at the notion of how the biology of the 21st century differs from that of the 20th century. Now, the 20th century had views of biological individuality, which were very set and very established. First, there was anatomical individuality. That's the countable. When you say there are 400 people here, that's 400 biological individuals. It's the physical body. Then there's physiological individuality. That's the integrated organ systems which come together for a common end. Uh, Lukert in Germany in the 19th century was a big proponent of you are a physiological individual. Then there's the individuality of development that the body is seen to be the product of the fertilized egg. Thomas Huxley was a big proponent of this developmental approach to individuality. 
Then more recently, there was the notion of immune individuality, that the immune system separated you from the environment and it separated you from everyone else. Then more recently, there was genetic <clears throat> individuality. This is the individuality given to us by our genome, that the genome of every cell in our body is the same genome and it's derived from the fertilized egg. So the notion of genetic individuality, which is promulgated by people such as Francis Collins or Richard Dawkins. Then there's of course, evolutionary individuality, that which is selected. The individuals or the genes, the organisms that get selected, that's the individual. So there are these six notions of how to be considered an individual. And what I'm gonna say here today is that they're all wrong. In 2013, a paper was published by 26 authors, which was entitled Animals in a Bacterial World, a new imperative for the life sciences. You don't hear the word imperative, something that must be thought of. You don't hear the word imperative very often in the biological literature. But here was an article talking about animals. Zoology has to be studied in its bacterial context. And a paper that I wrote with two other authors, Jan Sapp and Fred Tauber, basically said that we never were individuals. This notion of individuality is something which is not biologically relevant. And we came to the conclusion that there was a new biology, a new zoology, a zoology which really got started in about the year 2000, a biology of what we call holobionts. And the notion of the holobiont is that each organism is not made up solely of cells from the fertilized egg. Rather, the animal cells come from the zygote, from the fertilized egg, but also from the symbiotic microbes that it accumulates over time. So that an animal's genes come from both its parents and also from its microbes. So that an organism is a consortium of many species acting together, a holobiont. So I have some holobionts here, some obvious holobionts. We start with the cow. The cow is a herbivore. It's a plant eater, but there's no gene in the cow's genome that allows it to digest plant materials such as cellulose, hemicellulose, or pectin. The cow derived from the cow's genome cannot digest plants. What digests plants are the microbes that live within its stomach. And these microbes live in a particular portion of the stomach, its rumen. What's fascinating is that a newborn cow, a newborn calf does not have a functional rumen. The rumen is made by the bacteria when it enters this gut and is given plant material. The rumen is made in part by interactions between the microbes and the zygotic cells of the cow. Similarly, this termite here, Master Termes darwinensis. Master Termes eats wood. It's a pest. You don't wanna have Master Termes in your house. It will eat the wood. But Master Termes, as in most insects, does not have any gene that allows it to eat wood or cellulose. Those genes come from the protists and the microbes that live in the gut of this termite. Protists such as Mixotrica paradoxica. Mixotrica paradoxica is the protist that secretes the enzymes that digest wood. But it can't digest wood. This protist is actually a combination of five 
species that get together to form a common organism. And that common organism, Mixotrica, lives inside the gut of a termite. So the ability to eat wood is a property not only of the termite, but the termite plus its symbionts. We have here a coral, and this green coral is able to undergo photosynthesis. The coral gets 90% of its energy from algae, biosynthetically competent algae, which live inside the coral cells. And inside the coral cells, they can undergo photosynthesis, they can make the carbohydrates, which will feed the coral. Global warming is changing this situation such that the coral expel its algal symbionts and die because they can no longer get the energy and the carbohydrates from the chloroplasts of the algae. So we are not individuals in terms of an anatomical or physiological sense. We are holobionts, whole organisms that comprise both symbionts and zygote-derived cells. About 50% of the cells in our human body are microbial. They have specific locations and they're located here. These are some of the microbes found in the mouth and the airways, the skin, intestines, and so forth. We have about 160 species per person, about 11,000 species of microbes per human species. And you have to consider in this way of thinking that every pore is an ecosystem. That means that we are a co collection of ecosystems. We are not only an organism, we are a biome. We are a moving collection of ecosystems. So this changes our view. There are four ways of transmitting the microbes into the next generation. How do you transmit microbes? How do you get this consortium? Well, in insects, if I were to ask anyone who's taken developmental biology what this is a picture of, I hope they would say that this is the ovary, this is something in the ovary of an insect, and these are the nurse cells, and they are transporting something red into this cell over here, which is going to be the oocyte. And they'd be right. This red thing could be bicoid mRNA, nanos mRNA, ribosomes. But actually what this red, these red dots are, they're Wolbachia bacteria. The bacteria are being given to the egg so that it can go through the cells of the newborn. That's one way, which is vertical transmission right through the egg. There's also horizontal transmission through the birth canal. This is how we get our microbes. And here we have a giraffe and you can see the baby giraffe being born. Here, the amniotic fluid, the amnion has broken. The fetus is now in contact with the microbes that are lining the cavity of the female reproductive tract. And as we are born, we get coated with microbes. The microbes give us about 8 million different genes. We get only 22,000 different genes from our parents. And it's about a 70% transmission rate, which is very good considering that the transmission rate for alleles is only 50%. So we get our mother's bacteria. You can also get horizontal transmission through the feces. And here we have a koala bear and her pup. And the koala bear takes her feces, puts, rubs it with milk and puts it on the face of her offspring. That way she's assured that the offspring will get her bacteria. So here it's about 100% correct transmission. Here it's about 100% accurate transmission. Here it's about 70%. There's also, interestingly enough, animals who get their bacteria solely from their environment. And this is what we see with the squid Euprimna and the bacteria Vibrio fisheri. The squid is not born with a light organ. 
The squid, however, needs a light organ. It uses the light organ to get rid of its shadow when it forages on the uh, shallow ocean floor uh, near the seabed. It, it can be seen by predators by looking at its shadow. So it has a light that actually shines on the shadow and the shadow disappears. But the squid is not born with a light organ. The squid acquires bacteria on its ventral surface. Those bacteria interact with the squid and they go inside the squid, the bacteria go inside the squid to make the light organ. So you have here these interactions between different organisms and you have ways of getting the bacteria from one organism to another. Now in humans, we have a remarkable system. First, the bacteria that exist in a late pregnant woman and a pregnant woman in the last three months of pregnancy differs from her normal bacteria. The bacteria in the reproductive tract of the woman who is pregnant for, for in her last months of pregnancy differs from the normal bacteria. These are bacteria that if you add these bacteria to germ-free mice, give you a fatter mouse with insulin desensitization, just like pregnant women. These bacteria seem to be helping the woman's pregnancy. Moreover, when the fetus exits the mother, the fetus gets all these bacteria and these bacteria are important. And what does the mother do next? The mother feeds the baby and mother's milk is very important because mother's milk has two sets of nutrients. One set of nutrients is to give nourishment to the baby. That's kind of obvious. That's why you feed the baby. The second set of nutrients is a set of sugars that no mammal can digest. They're not for the baby. They're for the baby's bacteria. They are specifically for a certain group of bacteria, which we want in our gut. We want these bacteria to colonize our gut. Bacteria such as Bifidobacterium longum. These are bacteria which help our body to grow. So we get a special set of bacteria and we feed that special set of bacteria. Now, once we get these bacteria in our body, they do things to us. They actually are responsible for helping our body to function. And so the microbiota in our gut is involved in our circulatory system, in our digestive system, in our neuroendocrine system. It's needed for bone growth and it's actually needed to provide the basis for the immune system. In insects, you have here a fascinating system. This is the uh, bug, the mealy bug, Planococcus, it's an insect. Inside the cells of that insect is a bacterium called Trembolia. And inside the bacterium is a smaller bacterium called Marinella. And to make phenylalanine, the pathway begins inside the bacterial symbiont. And then it goes into the symbiont of the symbiont. Then it goes back again into the symbiotic bacteria. And then the last step is done in the actual insect's cytoplasm. So we have co-metabolism. Animals are not functioning as independent entities. We are holobionts. One example is peristalsis. We all remember peristalsis as those muscular contractions that move food through our guts. Now, what causes peristalsis? Muscle contraction. What causes muscle contraction? Nerve stimulation. There is a set of enteric neurons which are responsible for causing the muscle contractions. But these enteric neurons are not mature when the baby is born. They get matured by the gut microbes. The gut microbes manufacture short chain fatty acids, fatty acids such as butyric acid, propionic acid. And those short chain fatty acids 
stimulate the gut epithelium of the infant to make serotonin. Serotonin is a hormone which can take the immature neurons and make them into mature neurons. And what you find is that without bacteria, you have very poor intestinal transit of food. Here's a germ-free mouse without bacteria. Here's the normal, about twice as high. If you give bacteria to germ-free mice, you can get the intestinal transit to be the correct number. Similarly, with if you're looking at uh, serotonin production, germ-free mice make hardly any serotonin in their gut. Conventionally raised mice with germs, with bacteria, make a certain amount, and you can restore that certain amount by adding bacteria to the gut of germ-free mice. And so we're beginning to understand the interactions between the body and the microbes and how the microbes become part of the body. There is this co-metabolism between the microbes and the mammals. So here, when we digest tryptophan, the amino acid tryptophan in our diet, it gets turned by the bacteria into indole, which will make IPA. And IPA is a neuroprotectant antioxidant. There's a particular bacteria, Clostridium uh, sporogenes, which is making this IPA in your body, in your gut, and transferring it into your blood. Uh, again, the serotonin is uh, made uh, primarily by, it's induced by the microbes in the gut. Germ-free mice hardly make any. As much as one third of an animal's metabolome, the diversity of molecules carried in its blood has a microbial origin. Okay, just think about that. One third of the small molecules in your blood come from or are induced by microbes. So in that way, the circulatory system extends the chemical impact of the microbes throughout the body. 2013, Kwajiorkor, which was thought to be a disease of protein deficiency, was found to be a disease of protein deficiency only in the context of certain microbes and not others. So Smith and colleagues say that you have microbe host co-metabolism, a function of the microbiota and the host cells, so that the microbes and the host cells are interacting together. They in, the, their metabolism interpenetrates each other so that you have one organism which is made by the symbionts and the host, and those organisms have a shared those parts of the organisms have a shared metabolism. These symbionts can help regulate responses to important drugs. So digoxin, which is important for preventing heart attacks, it actually upregulates uh, uh, operons in ecthalolenta bacterium, which causes this bacterium to inactivate the drug. So here we have a system where a bacterium can inactivate drugs. In other cases, such as cyclophosphamide, the anti-cancer drug needs the bacteria in order to be active. So we have here drugs and the response to the drugs depend not necessarily on the genome of, that you get from your parents, but on the genomes you get from your microbes. So I am very wary of personalized medicine if it's only based on the genome of the person and not on the cooperative genome of the person and that person's microbes. The phenotype is a holobiont property. So here we have P. aphids and the P. aphid is a pathogenetic organism. It's an all female species and it gives birth pathogenetically. Whether or not the aphid has thermotolerance, whether it's able to produce offsprings at high temperatures, depends not on the genome of the aphid, which is clonal. All these aphids have the same genome pretty much, but they get their variation 
from the genomes of their symbionts. So certain symbionts allow the aphid to be thermotolerant, other symbionts do not. Now in development, which is really what I wanna talk about, you have co-development that you need other species in order to develop properly. And I mentioned that with the uh, example of the enteric neuron, which wouldn't become mature without the bacteria. So here we have more examples, such as this orchid. The beauty of this orchid is made possible by a fungal symbiont. The fungus allows the seed to open up and germinate. Whoops, something just happened here. Okay. Whoops, this is not letting me, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, what happened, sir? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just stop this for a moment. Uh, I hope uh, I'm gonna try to uh, get out of this. Uh, for some reason, it's uh, not allowing me to, uh, I, maybe if I press over here, there we go. Okay, good. Okay. So animals do not exist as independent entities. There's co-development to make the whole of biont. And so here we have the blood vessels of the intestine. Now the intestinal blood vessels here, can't seem to get my pointer going, but uh, the intestinal blood vessels shown in the center there, those are villi. Those are the villi of the intestine. And the green here is showing you the blood vessels that are surrounding the villi. These are the blood vessels that take the food from the intestine to give it to the rest of the body. On the left-hand side, what you see are intestinal vessels from mice that develop without microbes. And you can see that the vessels are very poorly organized. There's not a good vasculature here. Okay, let's see if we get this back. Okay, there's not a good vasculature. And over here, you could see what's happening. This is really important. This is what got me into this field in that you're looking here at angiogenin messenger RNA. This is the amount of messenger RNA for the protein angiogenin. Now angiogenin is a protein which is made by the panic cells of the intestine. And when the intestinal panic cells make this protein, they secrete it and angiogenin tells the mesenchyme cells around it, the mesoderm cells around it to become blood vessels. So angiogenin is the, is the protein secreted by the intestinal cells that tell the cells around it to make blood vessels. Okay, in germ-free mice, you have a certain level of this protein being made and it's set to 1.0 to one. In conventionally raised mice, mice, that have bacteria in its gut, you have tenfold that much. You have tenfold the amount of angiogenin being made. So germ-free mice are like mutants that only have 10% of the normal activity of the uh, angiogenin. Bacteroides, theta iota micron, is the bacteria that's largely responsible for inducing the panic cells of the intestine to make angiogenin-4. So here we have a bacteria, Bacteroides, telling the epithelial cell to turn on different genes. And those genes are responsible for normal development. So microbes help form the normal gut by inducing expression in the mammalian cells. You have what's called sympoesis. You become yourself by becoming with other species. This is a new way of thinking. This is 21st century biology, not 20th century biology. Okay. Microbial symbionts cause stem cells to divide in zebrafish. 
so that if you look at these magenta cells here, these pink cells, these are stem cells dividing. In germ-free mice without the bacteria, you have very few stem cells dividing. So microbial symbionts actually causing the wind pathway to uh, be uh, stimulated cause stem cell division in zebrafish guts. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay. The expansion of insulin producing pancreatic cells is also induced by gut bacteria. Here, the gut bacteria is Aramonis, and Aramonis, if it's in the water, will be taken up by the gut and cause the pancreatic cells to expand. This green here, that's insulin. These are insulin producing beta cells of the pancreas. Without that microbe, you don't have the expansion. You have very few uh, cells, very few uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the insulin producing cells there. Okay. Normal my gut microbes also modulate brain development. Here we see NGF1A, which is involved in neural plasticity. In mice with bacteria, you have a lot of expression compared to germ-free mice. Similarly, with BDNF, uh, the neurotrophic factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, much more expression with bacteria than without bacteria. Germ-free mice have neurological problems. They have elevated dopamine, elevated norepinephrine and serotonin. They have lower amounts of NGF1A and BDNF. They really have some problems. And it's said in this paper, during evolution, the colonization of gut microbiota has become integrated into the programming of brain development, affecting motor control and anxiety-like behaviors. Okay, so the gut microbes are involved in making us who we are. Matter of fact, you can go even further. Not only do the microbes inside the gut cause neurological changes, the microbes that the pregnant mother has in her gut can go through the blood, through the placenta, into the fetus inside her body, inside the uterus, and change the development inside that mouse, such that the maternal microbiome modulates fetal neural development in mice. The maternal microbiome pr pr promotes neural axon growth. It promotes the growth of axons primarily in the region involved in hearing, so that normally metabolites from the maternal gut microbes stimulate the growth of these neurons and the animal will later be startled by a loud sound. It will hear very well. Whereas in the absence of metabolites from the maternal gut microbes, you have abnormal brain development. These neurons do not develop properly and you do not have the mouse being startled by a, a loud sound. So what you have here is that metabolites made by the bacteria in the mother's gut go through her circulatory system, through the placenta, into the circulatory system of the fetus and into the brain of the fetus, changing its development. Germ-free mice also have behavioral problems. They have autism-like behaviors, such that germ-free mice, when you put them in an empty chamber, if you give them a choice of being with other mice or in an empty chamber, prefer to be in the empty chamber. However, if you add the microbes back, they'll act more like normal mice, germ, you know, normal bacteria, bold mice, and have normal behaviors with other mice. Similarly, if you look at the time spent in obsessive behaviors, uh, mice with bacteria have a certain amount of those behaviors. Mice without bacteria have much more of this obsessive behaviors. And if you add bacteria back to those mice, you get the behavior going back to normal levels. The immune system is a property of the holobiont. It's not just the defensive weaponry of the host. 
Germ-free mice have impaired development of the Peyer's patches. They have impaired development of T helper cells. They have reduced T regulator cells and reduced B cell populations. And here we have the gut associated lymphoid tissue. You have the activated B cells and the activated T cells, the dome and follicle of the gut associated lymphoid tissue. Without bacteria, you have neither. You don't have the activated B cells. You don't have the activated T cells. Matter of fact, you can get this by this phenomenon by feeding the mouse different, by feeding the animal different milk. These are macaque monkeys. Macaque monkeys develop different sets of bacteria depending on whether they're given formula milk or mother's milk. The bacteria have hardly any overlap. They get a different population of bacteria depending on the type of milk they have. And this, type, this, this causes immune properties, immune differences. For instance, bacteria promoted by breast milk make arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid induces T helper 17 cells so that breastfed macaque monkeys have more Th17 cells than formula fed macaque monkeys. Th17 cells are important because they make interleukin 17 and interleukin 22 that induce the gut cells to make proteins against candida, salmonella, and staphylococcus, opportunistic infections. And as you probably know, there's been a whole lot of research on the microbes in humans and that uh, stunted microbiota and opportunistic pathogen colonization in cesarean sections that opportunistic, opportunistic infections are more prevalent in cesarean births and even allergies are seem to be uh, uh, cured in a way by giving, giving certain bacteria or prevented. I want to end by talking about evolution and microbes. Lynn Margulis said, in short, I believe that most evolutionary novelties arose and still arise directly from symbiosis. Life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. And I wanna talk specifically here about herbivory. As I mentioned before, most insects and most vertebrates do not have genes for digesting plants. But we know that herbivory is common among insects and it's common among vertebrates. How does it happen? It happens because of symbionts. And the symbiont, the holobiont that I wanna talk about now is the cow. The cow digests its food through the rumen. The rumen is a particular part of the cow's stomach, it's the major part, it's 85% the volume of the cow's stomach. And it's essentially a large anaerobic fermentation chamber where plant degrading rumen microbes ferment otherwise non-digestible plant-based foodstuffs into primarily the volatile fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, okay? So this is how the cow becomes a herbivore. The cow becomes a herbivore because it has microbes in its rumen. That's symbiosis. Here's the fascinating thing. Well, I'll get to the fascinating thing in a moment. <laughs> Just that the rumen microbiome is itself a complex ecosystem. It has cellulose degrading bacteria, fungi, and protists. These digest the plant walls into hexose sugars. You have the fermenting bacteria taking these hexose sugars into short chain fatty acids. You have methanogenic archaea, which makes this a more efficient process. And you have detoxifying bacteria that prevent, destroy, or eliminate poisons from the plants. Okay. Now, what really fascinates me is that the rumen where this digestion takes place does not exist as a functional organ in the newborn calf. Newborn calves have sterile rumens. However, within a day or two of birth, the rumen gets colonized from birth, gets colonized by the numerous microbes. The microbial colonization of the rumen is important. It stays there. It just, the microbes just stay in that region, but the rumen is non-functional and it hasn't developed yet. 
As soon as the calf eats grass, as soon as the calf stops eating milk, drinking milk, and starts eating grass, the grasses get digested by the bacteria that's in this ruminal area. And when the bacteria get digested, they make the hexoses, the sugars, and the sugars get made into short chain fatty acids. And the fatty acids interact with the, intest with the gut cells and they make the rumen. The rumen is made by the microbes. The but butyrate, you could take butyric acid and put it into the gut and you'll get the rumen being made. The rumen, the, the butyric acid and propionic acid actually induce transcription factors that start the process of rumen formation. So the rumen bacteria present in the rumen since day two ferment dry feed into butyric acid. Butyric acid causes the developmental changes that generate the mature rumen. So the bacteria construct their niche, the rumen. They make a home for themselves. And this is developmental symbiosis. And butyric acid, when given to unweaned calves directly or in their diet, causes these changes. Butyric acid is a nucleosome modifying agent. Now, the bacterial community is able to ferment the grass and the grain into simple carbohydrates and short chain fatty acids, and you have the nutritional symbiosis. So the cow shows what a holobiont does. The, the nutritional symbiosis is essential for the life of the cow. The developmental symbiosis, it was makes the cow a cow and allows the cow to be a herbivore. So the 21st century view of individuality for animals. We are holobionts. We are biomes as well as individuals. We become with the other. So becoming with the other is as important, if not more, than being against all others. We don't have anatomical individuality. Most of our cells happen to be microbes. We don't have physiological individuality. Rather, we have joined metabolic pathways. We don't have genetic individuality. The gut microbes help build the gut. They help build the immune system and even brain neurons. We don't have immune individuality. The microbes help build the immune system, expand our lymphocyte repertoire. The microbes actually become part of our self. And we don't have genetic individuality. The genome evolved with those of the symbionts. We have over a hundred different genomes in our body, many of which can give different phenotypic outcomes. And evolutionary individuality, symbionts can provide selectable variation and isolation and new ways of evolving. Oops. So it's here again. Okay. Symbiosis is the evolutionary strategy that supports life on earth, whether we're talking about rhizobacteria and legumes for nitrogen fixation, mycorrhizal interactions with plant roots and seeds, endophytic fungal protecting against fungi, protecting against desiccation, the coral reef and tidal seagrass ecosystems that sustain oceanic diversity. These are the huge symbiotic webs that allow the earth to survive. And within these big symbioses are the smaller symbioses that we call organisms. And within them, even more ancient symbioses that we call cells and genomes. So we have zoology in the 21st century, a new type of zoology. And this presentation is being given by team Scott Gilbert. I am more than just the cells I got from my parents. I am a holobiont composed of zygotic cells and microbes. Thank you very much. Let's see, what a, end share screen. <laughs> Stop share, there we go. Thank you so much, sir, for your lucid presentation. Thank you. We all are overwhelmed because of your presentation and we are able to communicate to you.
and we are able to see you i am very Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad that to, I'm very glad to be here. And uh, I hope that uh, I hope that uh, the 21st century will be something that uh, will be a huge change in the way we study zoology, because I think there is just so much to re to unlearn, as well as learn, we have to do a lot of unlearning in order to get uh, something new happening. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, there are some questions uh, in the chat box. Can we discuss it? Yes, of course. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, one question is, how does stress-based natural selection work on the co-selection and evolution of such interdependent symbiotic relationships. Can one okay. track these corresponding evolutionary co-dependency in bacterial me genomes? How can okay. metagenomics contribute to these understanding? Ah, okay. I think that metagenomics will be a great way to contribute, and it already is contributing a lot. Uh, uh, metagenetics right now is looking at things like uh, soil bacteria, and, uh, you know, uh, there are, what, 10 to the 8th bacteria in a gram of soil or something. I mean, it's just huge. And the only way that we can know about the populations are from metagenomic analysis. So I think that this will be a major way of looking at, uh, at, the, at, at genome evolution. I think that looking at the selection of microbes by plants, for instance, will be a remarkably interesting endeavor because the plants select the microbes and the plants are exuding chemicals that change the microbial composition of the soil near them. And so we know that uh, this is happening and we're just beginning to explore how the selection is being done. One fascinating situation that occurred in Japan recently uh, involved uh, uh, the uh, plant bug, the soy bug, Riptortis. And Riptortis has a symbiont that it acquires from the soil. And this symbiont helps it grow. It actually helps with uh, producing juvenile hormone. It helps the larva, it helps the instars become very robust. It's a good thing to have. Now, the farmers sprayed the soy plants with insecticide because they don't want this soy bug to eat their plants. Now, it got rid of a lot of the soy bugs, but it also, this insecticide went into the soil and some of the bacteria were able to use this insecticide as food. They were able to metabolize the insecticide. And so these bacteria spread throughout the farmlands. Not only did this bacteria spread, but when the Riptortis bug incorporated this bacteria into its body, it became resistant to the pesticide. So we're getting selection, we're getting evolution in really interesting ways from the, uh, from the uh, uh, microbes. And so I think that metagenomics is going to be really important in figuring out what populations uh, are existing and which ones are being selected. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is from Nisha Vashishta from Delhi University. Uh, she's asking, uh, it is said you are what you are what you eat. <laughs> How? Your food manipulates your gut microbial ecosystem. 
oh, you, you are to a large extent what you eat. And yeah. every, every time you eat, you change the microbial population. You have a microbial population, but which microbes are going to be uh, given the food to proliferate and which ones are not? And some of the most interesting events right now are studies involving the role of fiber in diets because the fiber is what eventually makes those short chain fatty acids <clears throat> which are needed for heart development. They're probably needed for brain development. They're needed all over the body. And the microbes are a major source of these short chain fatty acids. And so uh, I've, I've added more fiber to my diet. I want those bi microbes to be happy. But yeah, uh, there are microbes that uh, increase when you drink red wine because the compounds in the red wine will feed certain bacteria and not others. Uh, there are some microbes that really like uh, uh, cheese or really like dairy. So our population of microbes changes every time we take a bite. Okay. And another message is from Varsha Bhaveta. Uh, she's, actually, it is a message. So we may say that the bacteria or microbes are the basis of evolution. We will change when these microbes mutate. Uh, I'm sorry, could you re please repeat that? Uh, that yeah, micro yeah. Uh, she's saying that. So we may say that the bacteria or microbes are the basis of evolution. We will change when these microbes mutate. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> only partly, only partly so. Uh, I think that our own genomes do play a role, but there are some remarkable uh, evolutionary changes that are going on with microbes. And some of these changes may be critical in major evolutionary events. Uh, for instance, uh, there are certain coanoflagellates, which are the closest thing to animals. These are the protists that are the closest protists to animals, coanoflagellates. Usually they are one-celled animals, but in the presence of certain microbes, they become multicellular. When they divide, they don't separate. Rather, they form eight or 16 cells with a common matrix around them and with junctions between the cells, they become an epithelium. And so the basis of multicellularity might've been cooperation between unicellular protists and bacteria. Similarly, a different type of bacteria will take those coanoflagellates and instead of reproducing asexually by splitting, it'll cause them to form sperm and egg, and they will actually form sexually. So microbes may have been involved in initiating multicellularity and sexuality. Tom Bosch in Germany is saying that the origin of the nervous system came about before you had a immune system it came about in animals like hydra, cnidarians, and the function, the original function of the nervous system was the placement of symbionts within the trunk of the animal. So there have definitely been some major evolutionary, well, not definitely, there have probably been some major evolutionary events that are occasioned by microbes. But I think that we, as a holobiont, it's both the microbes and us that are evolving as a team. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Deepak Modi is wanted to ask a question. Uh, please, Deepak Modi, sir. Yeah. You're muted. Hello, You're still yeah. Yes, I can now. I thank you, Scott. That's been a wonderful talk. It's always a pleasure to uh, listen to you. You have already answered a part of my questions on uh, uh, how evolution will be shaped to our gut microbiome or the microbiome that we are. I was wondering now, is it time to now change the, teaching the Darwinian theory of evolution? 
that mm. it is not just now our our environment, but the gut microbiome or the whole symbionts, which you will now take up some comments. Yeah. yeah, I think that the neo-Darwinian view of evolution, that it's selection of the genes uh, has to be modified. I think that uh, the notion of the environment as being selective, and that's all it is, has to be changed because the environment is not only selective, it's instructive. And so now you have an instructive environment. The environment is like a professor. The environment is teaching and then it tests. <laughs> you know, it, it, and one of the things that I say is that uh, natural selection doesn't create that development, which includes developmental genetics, developmental plasticity, and developmental symbiosis. Development has the creativity of an artist. Natural selection has the creativity of a curator. That the curator will say which things are worthwhile, which things go best with which things, which other things. And but the ability to create something that's done by development. And so most evolutionary theory as taught, you know, the Darwinian evolutionary theory, most evolutionary theory looks at the survival of the fittest. What we now have to do is to include the arrival of the fittest. And that means you have to talk about development and you have to talk about symbiosis during development. And I think that that's, again, that's 21st century biology. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, one more question in the chat box. Uh, it is from Subhajit Sen from CBS Mumbai. Uh, how does stress-based natural selection work on the co-selection and evolution? of such interdependent symbiotic relationships? Can one track these corresponding evolutionary co-dependency in bacterial mesonomes? Actually, this question is you over, I think. Yeah, already That's, discussed, yeah. So it's how does stress induce bacterial changes? I'm sorry, is that the correct? Can we, track, can we track these corresponding evolutionary codependency in bacterial ah. me genomes? How can yeah. metagenomics contribute to this understanding? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it, it, this is a different question than before. But uh, the, the, the uh, metagenomics, uh, I think, will be incredibly important. Uh, in this, I think that uh, uh, looking at the different uh, uh, bacterial populations, even in the gut, as I said before, when we eat uh, something, different bacteria are allowed to proliferate and other bacteria are not. And so I think that this is going to be a way of looking at the bacterial populations. Which ones are we permitting to you know, be in our gut and evolve in our gut? I also think that uh, we as humans are making many new environments that the bacteria can proliferate in. Bacteria never before humans had seen drain pipes. Bacteria had never seen toilet seats. You know, we, we've made all sorts of new niches for bacteria. And we are now in the position where we can actually see how our technology is allowing bacteria to change its evolutionary patterns. I think this is really fascinating. I think that if you want, you could say that, well, Stephen Jay Gould said that this is the age of bacteria. It always was the age of bacteria, always will be the age of bacteria. And we animals and we plants, are just manifestations that the bacteria made in order for bacteria to proliferate and diverge. That animals 
form incredible niches for bacteria. Plants form wonderful niches for bacteria. And the story of Gaia, the story of the earth is a story of bacterial development and bacterial evolution. And that's what we're seeing today. Uh, and that's what metagenomics uh, is going to do wonderfully for us is track the way these bacteria are, are, uh, are spreading throughout the world into technological niches that never existed before. Yeah. Again, 21st century zoology. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sampada Bache has uh, raised a hand and uh, she wanted to ask a question. Sampada Bache. Okay, before, uh, before that, uh, we will take another question in the chat box. Is there a possible link between neurodevelopmental disorders and the microbes associated with us? And if yes, have there been any studies based on this? Mm -hmm. uh, there are now several studies. Uh, there was a preliminary report in Science Reports, uh, I think 2018, which looked at human autism. Now, human autism probably has many causes, but there seem to be some individuals who have different microbes that you can measure in their feces samples. And these, there was a set of people, and this was a pilot study, 18 people who were diagnosed with severe, with severe uh, autism. And they were given, well, first of all, all their, their bacteria mm -hmm. in their gut was wiped, wiped out with uh, antibiotics. And they were given microbes from healthy people. And what they found was this in, within two years, the symptoms of autism became less severe and some became not severe at all. So there are studies going on now looking at autism and microbes. There are studies going on now about Parkinson's disease and microbes. Parkinson's disease might originate actually in the gut and be transferred to the brain. Uh, allergies are being looked at as controlled by microbes. And one of the fascinating things is this idea that Humans evolved with animals, that humans expect certain bacteria from being associated with animals. Usually throughout human history, humans have been associated with animals. However, in the 20th century, that link was broken. In Europe, the First World War, about 1914, the horse was eliminated from city streets. And people started living without their animal companions. And it's thought now, and there's good evidence for it, that certain bacteria, which are associated with animals, are needed for human lung development so that we do not get asthma, human lung and leukocyte, lymphocyte development, so that humans don't get asthma. There's a group of Finnish researchers who have some really interesting data saying that people who live on farms have a different set of lymphocytes than those who live in cities and that these lymphocytes are important in that they prevent asthma. So yeah, there's studies that are ongoing now, studies which, you know, you know, 20 years ago, who would have thought that, you know, neural diseases and things like al allergies would be linked to microbes? Now it seems they might be. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lata Sardesai is there. Uh, she has raised her hand. Lata Sardesai. Hello, Lata Sardesai. Okay, sir. Uh, one more question. How does, how does <coughs> gut microbiome shape evolution? Are we changing the dimensions of the Darwinian theory of evolution? <laughs> okay. I think that uh, 
the gut microbes, microbes in general are changing our view of evolution because we're viewing evolution as a team effort. Uh, again, not everyone agrees with this, but I think that when you look at selection, you're looking at the selection of individuals and those individuals are composite holobiont organisms. That holobionts are being selected. And the analogy that I often use is to that of a football team. Now, you might have the best goalie in the league, but if that goal, if that team doesn't have people who can score the goals, the team stays where it is and it doesn't go into the playoffs. It's the whole team that gets selected and not its individual players. And I think that's what happens in evolution. It's the whole team that gets selected and not the parts of the team. And so I think that looking at evolution this way, one finds a whole new way of looking at, uh, at selection. For instance, selection for the ability to digest plants, that's relatively new. And that's one of the interesting things is that when you think about herbivory, you often think of, well, there are herbs and the animals that eat them, they're herbivores. And then there were the carnivores that eat the herbivores. Well, actually evolutionarily, the herbivores came later than the carnivores. You had the plants and then you had detritivores, which would eat dead plants. And then you had the carnivores, which would eat the detritivores. Herbivory comes very late in evolution, both in terms of arthropods and vertebrates. And so that's a kind of interesting phenomena. The plant eaters come after the meat eaters. You had to evolve the ability to digest plant material. And so uh, that's opened up a whole new avenue of evolution, herbivory. It's, you know, the rumen, the ruminates, you know, that's a whole new way of doing nutrition. Uh, and that happened separately in insects many times, in vertebrates many different times. So you have that as I think a beautiful example of how the gut microbes can uh, change evolution. Uh, right now in the panda, uh, we're seeing uh, what might be a transition because a panda is a carnivore, it's a bear, uh, but it's eating the shoots of plants. It's eating the newborn plant material. Uh, and it has microbes that allow it to eat hemicelluloses, but not celluloses. So it can, young, it can eat young plant material, but not hard plant material. So I think that gut microbes are very much involved in opening up new evolutionary niches. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ashish is asking, do microbial flora have any role in development of diseases with unexplained origin? Uh, I'm sorry, do, do yeah, yeah, I am repeating, sir. Okay, please. Do microbial flora have any role in development of diseases with unexplained origin? Ah, yeah, we, <laughs> if we knew they wouldn't be unexplained. Uh, but yes, uh, people are looking at uh, uh, all sorts of diseases, especially uh, inflammatory diseases. Uh, it's really interesting when uh, uh, it was discovered that uh, gastric cancer could be caused by you know, a microbe, by Helobacter pylori. Uh, that was a new way of looking at cancer. Uh, and uh, there are inflammatory diseases, especially bowel inflammatory diseases, which people are looking at in terms of possible microbes. There are a lot of gynecological diseases that people are saying maybe what's causing them is different microbes in certain environments. Uh, so uh, even infertility, people are looking at, is there a microbial component to infertility? So yes, uh, this has opened up a whole new area of medicine 
looking at the symbionts and the communities that exist in various niches and how those communities are interacting with the epithelial cells of the body. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, can we take uh, some more questions, sir? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, Oz Mughal is asking question. How broad spectrum antibiotics can affect the microbes flora in body? What would be its future harms and what can be researched towards it? Yes, <laughs> wide spectrum antibiotics, which have been used so much, can be very dangerous to the body. And one of the best examples of this, or I, sh I should say one of the worst examples of it, is uh, clostridium. Uh, which people get in hospitals when they have had wide spectrum antibiotics get rid of most of the bacteria in their bodies. And clostridium, which is in the air, can now colonize the gut because there's no other bacteria there to stop it. And clostridium, especially clostridium difficile, uh, can cause life-threatening diarrhea. It could cause evacuation of the fluid in your body and really cause lethal consequences. One of the interesting things is that you can get rid of clostridium bacteria in humans by giving humans transplants of feces, by putting in the feces of healthy people into their gut. That can actually get rid of, or you take the bacteria from the feces and you put that into the gut and that can get rid of the clostridium. So wide spectrum antibiotics can have really devastating consequences to one's health. Uh, and uh, they can be remedied by putting back normal bacteria. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh... Lata Sardesai uh, wanted yes, to ask question. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Gaikwad, sir. On behalf of Mumbai University, I would like to congratulate you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It's, thank it's you. A, a I've been, I've been, I've been in, I've been in Mumbai. I've enjoyed, uh, yeah, I've enjoyed that city. So we would like to meet and have actual offline <laughs> interactions. <laughs> But uh, would... my question was regarding uh, while working with the solid waste management, uh, we have come across a lot of soil microbes and the whole system of soil microbes is helping for degradation or the detritus specifically. And had that not been in the environment, the whole heaps of bodies would have been over there, the dead bodies the microorganisms which are acting on the dead bodies. I think if you can throw a bit of light on this, because even uh, the marine debris of huge animals, uh, yeah. everything I... gets cleaned. So yeah. as a cleaning agent, uh, that's also a part of symbiosis, I feel. But I do not have in-depth uh, information regarding oh, this. Can yeah. you enlighten us? Oh, well, certainly what's called saprophytic symbiosis, the, uh, the ability to digest dead animal and plant material is absolutely critical to the ecosystem. Uh, I live right next to a rainforest, and it's amazing this time of year to see the fungi proliferating, and you could see the wood crumbling away. It's really remarkable. Uh, and I think that, again, uh, this is an area where I think metagenomics is going to be important because it's not a single microbe that is going to do this. It's going to be the community of microbes. And I think it will be found, my guess is that it will be found to be very similar to what one sees in the rumen of cows, where you have a system of microbes some of which are producing the fermentation, some of which are doing the cellulose digestion, other microbes which are producing chemicals that make the reactions faster, 
uh, and so that you have whole communities of decomposing bacteria and fungi and archaea. And I just think that this is such an important and really wide open field to get really the metabolic pathways of degradation sorted out. I just think, uh, yeah, again, this is part of zoology. What happens to that dead carcass? What happens to the dead animal? How is that recycled? And in what directions are it recycled? Yeah, I think that that's going to be a whole new area. Yeah. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Uh, I will join two questions together. Uh, one is, does the gut microbiome affect on the mental health? And another question, can we say bacteria and virus together are responsible for birth of any functional life? Uh, the viruses I didn't talk about. I know very little about the viruses and most people don't know much about viruses. About, but the viruses, for every bacteria that we have, we have thousands of viruses. The bacteriophage is critical in keeping the bacterial population selected. So not only are the food working, the nutrition working to keep a bacterial population, but so are the viruses which can infect the bacteria. And so there's a whole new area of biology which is looking at viruses, not only in our gut, but viruses in the marine ecosystem, in the uh, uh, lake ecosystems, in all ecosystems, because if the bacteria play a role in regulating development and regulating physiology, the viruses play a role in regulating which bacteria survive. And so uh, it's again, another layer that's being added onto uh, the uh, ecosystems that we're calling our guts or our skin. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Nitin Kamre uh, wanted to ask a question and his question is, is global warming and environmental pollution affect symbiotic interaction involved in developmental biology? Uh, the answer unfortunately is yes, that uh, uh, global warming is having changes in bacterial and fungal populations, especially fungal populations, uh, both good and bad fungi, uh, uh, but we're seeing pathogenic fungi in Northern latitudes that had never seen these fungi before. And these are fungi that can destroy, uh, that can destroy trees. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are interactions uh, between uh, uh, microbes in insect uh, guts that are being stressed by heat and that uh, the heat, we don't know if it's affected the interactions yet, but in the laboratory, heat can break the uh, sim can break symbiotic interactions by allowing certain bacteria to proliferate more than other bacteria. I do not know yet if there's been evidence from uh, natural populations or not. There probably has been. I should probably look that up. Uh, I know that uh, other stresses, uh, other human cause events have changed uh, uh, fungal distribution. For instance, when the red turpentine beetle came from my area, the Pacific Northwest of the United States into China, it was originally in the Pacific Northwest, a very benign, you know, it wasn't even a pest. It got rid of dead trees. It destroyed dead trees. But the red turpentine beetle in China got a new symbiont. It got a different type of fungus. And that fungus can, and can kill live trees. And over a million trees have been destroyed in China due to the evolution of a, a beetle by a symbiont. Uh, which took it from being non-pathogenic to being pathogenic. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Gaikwad, sir. Yeah. 
there is a very interest <coughs> extremely sorry there is very interesting question yeah. uh, from kishor sabade uh, sir what type of difficulties problems you have faced while writing the book developmental biology and please share your experience and give suggestions or opinion to the young generation so <clears throat> he is interested to know embryonic development of developmental biology ah uh. Well, I was very lucky because when I started writing the book, we didn't know very much. So the book, the first edition of the book has big print and lots of big pictures uh, because we didn't really know much. The first editions of the book were written before transcription factors were known. They were written before paracrine factors were known. They were written before cadherins were known. So it was easy to start a book then. I think a lot easier than now. Uh, uh, I've had a lot of wonderful experiences writing the book. And some of the ex best experiences I've had have been when I ask people to send me new papers that they may have written. And I will get some of these new papers. And in one case, for instance, a researcher wrote me, thank you very much for requesting my, my papers. However, I must tell you, that there is another set of papers coming out by another laboratory, which are much better than ours. And you should wait for them. Now, this, this was a person who obviously really thought that education was more important than his reputation. And I've, I've experienced a lot of just wonderful interactions with developmental biologists, uh, uh, and so writing a book has been a lot of fun for me. Uh, I've enjoyed working with artists. I've enjoyed working with uh, uh, editors. I've had the same editor for 30 years uh, who started with me on number one and ended with me uh, on number 11, which is the last one I did without a co-author. I mean, I guess, no, number 10, the last one I did without a co-author. Uh, so we came together and, you know, I had the same editor uh, and she could tell me things about my writing that no one else could. She'll send me an email with a paragraph I wrote and she'll say, did you really write this crap? And uh, I said, oops, yeah, that, I'm sorry. That was a mistake. Uh, so uh, I've really enjoyed writing the book. I've had hundreds of experiences uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm very glad that I did it. I'm very glad I did it when I did it. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of been uh, remarkable to kind of be a chronicler of the molecularization of developmental biology and the way that developmental biology has developed from 1980 to the present. I mean, yeah, I started writing the book in 1980. The first edition was 1985. Uh, so uh, it's been a long way. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, I've been lucky. Yeah, another question in the chat box. Uh, it is from Tumul Singh, Dr. Tumul Singh from Varanasi. Uh, does this microbiome work similarly in wild type natural system as compared to cultured system? Yeah, I think that again, metagenomics is going to be important here because this, I think that we are starting to work on wild systems and we're taking one of the great <laughs> problems of working with developmental symbiosis is that most of the organisms do not grow well in the laboratory. And so you have to work in the wild system if you're going to get any answers at all. Uh, some people are trying to make organoids that will incorporate the uh, microbes. And uh, there are some that are coming along really well. Uh, so I think that uh, in a way, developmental symbiosis is forcing us to go into the wild. It's forcing us to work with natural populations and then take that work back into the laboratory and see if we can uh, make it simpler. But I think we're working with complex ecosystems. And so 
in a way, the developmental biologist and developmental biology in the 1800s was outdoors. It looked at the effect of the environment on development. And then in the 1900s, it came indoors because it was to model physiology and the physiology of development became important. And then the genetics of development became important and that kept it indoors. And developmental symbiosis and developmental plasticity kind of forcing us to go back outdoors again. And as we know from the microbes, it's sometimes much healthier to be outdoors. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Uh, I'm extremely sorry to say that uh, we are not able to consider all the questions here due to the time yeah. constraint. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to invite Professor Nitin Kambli for vote of thanks. Kambli, sir, over to you. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning. Namaste. Namaste. On behalf of all Indians, all academicians, all teachers, it's a great salute to world-renowned scientist, teacher, writer, a great speaker. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. We are very Namaste. much grateful to listen to you, sir. Oh, so, I sir, thank you. Yes, sir. It is a huge crowd on this platform. Mm -hmm. So more than five hundred thousands okay. of academician teachers. They and have joined. Excuse me, excuse me, sir. And on uh, YouTube also, there are hundreds yes, of participants how, how, watching you. Yes, live. yes. How, thousands of academician teachers from the India. They have joined, and uh, really, they have enjoyed this academic treat. Thank so. You. So we feel proud, honored, and uh, we are grateful to have a witness of this uh, particular lecture. Uh, definitely, sir, definitely, uh, we are having a good treat in this, uh, uh, with this lecture in the developmental biology. Definitely, you have given uh, so many things regarding the uh, biological individuality in the life sciences, especially role of holobiont, role of bacteria in the development of uh, uh, mammals, organ functioning, and uh, different types of roles in the gene expressions related with the mammals, fetal neurodevelopment, and mammalian function. Especially, you have quoted one sentence, becoming with a development with others, definitely. The symbiosis is required, but there are, I think, there are a number of factors which may in future can affect to the symbiosis or interaction. So we have to protect this genome, this microbiota for the development, for the crucial development, uh, and for the uh, good kind of evolution in future. Thank you for sir wonderful uh, lecture you have uh, given us. I really appreciate the contribution, your contribution in the scientific world. On behalf of all the academic community, all the teachers, all the administration from the India, I thank you, sir. And uh, I extend my thanks to the uh, today's uh, convener and coordinator of this lecture series for arranging such a nice lecture and giving a treat, academic treat for all the academicians. Thank you, sir, on behalf of all the Indians. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank sir. you. Thank you. Go to my person. Okay. Thank you. Once again, th thank you very much, sir. And uh, in future, we hope you with us. <laughs> I would love to be there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much, sir. Uh, it's a oh. pleasure. I've, yeah. I'm, thank you. And I hope all your symposia on the future of zoology yeah. go yeah. wonderfully well. It's a great topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so time. much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. Have a nice. Right. Yeah. Uh, so there is announcement. Uh,
second lecture will begin at 2 pm so it is kind request to all join this second lecture in time thank you very much and i yes you thank you sir to... i want to announce yeah, yeah i want to make a announcement yeah please uh, dear all participants second lecture will also be of the same quality like that you have experienced Uh, with the talk of Professor Dr. Dilkot Sir, in the same way, second lecture will be of Professor Dr. Niaz Ahmed. He is Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Awardee, the most prestigious award given by Government of India to the scientist who belongs to India. So I request you all to be there at one forty-five, and Sir's discussion will be on antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So. i request you all to join today's afternoon session with the same huge number of participants thank you one and all yeah thank you deshmukh sir with this uh, i declare that uh, first session is over and there is a break till the 2 pm yes sir yes sir. okay thank you